So I'll begin to read right here from my own personal notes here that I have taken. I am really stunned to find out that there was a considerable effort and because of the, because of the asteroids and meteorite, meteorite situation. They have committed a pretty substantial amount of resources in trying to mathematically calculate percentages and probabilities and stuff like that of strikes, where the strikes would take place, and those types of things. And I guess their thinking, which is understandable, is that, you know, if it happened before, I think you get like the pathing information where the paths of things are coming from. And the probability is that all the next strike will probably follow some sort of path that is that a past strike has followed. That's kind of their thinking. You know, when we begin to have this discussion and I'm listening to this, and I'm listening to the Pentagon is trying to calculate the path of something and that they feel like that once they know the path, they have an idea of what's going to happen again. I realize we're not talking about some asteroid coming in and striking the Earth. I realize we were getting into something quite a bit different from the very outset of our meeting. And he went on to say, it's pretty interesting report. Talking about the report that the Pentagon has put out within itself amongst those that have that particular level of clearance. The more interesting part of it was not only the giant situation. <laughs> I, I got to pause just for a moment, right? We're talking already about pathing of some kind of celestial object. We're talking about that a substantial amount of resources had already been spent on the mathematical calculations of incoming asteroids and comets, or not comets, but meteorites. And then I'm being told that they're examining this pathing information because if they figure if they can realize what happened, however long ago it may have been, that they have a good chance of knowing what's going to happen in the future. And then we start off in the next comment. It's, and it says, it's pretty interesting report. It's more interesting. Part of it was not only the giant situation, but that I would call super giants. Now we're talking about giants. So that lets me know that the time frame of the report and the research that's being done is back during the times of when we had giants on the earth. Now, which giants was that? The giants that we see after, uh, uh, after the Andalusian destruction, in other words, before the great flood, or is it the giants before the flood? Now, Quite frankly, I always thought the giants before and after were about the same size, even though I knew that Enoch recorded that those giants were, what, like 30 cubits or something like that? I mean, really a, a height that would exceed anything imaginable for us. I thought it was a typographical error, quite frankly. I really did. Uh, we're talking about well over 1,000, maybe two, 3,000 feet tall, if I understand right. And that seems like totally impossible. Whereas the giants after the flood, nine foot to 20 foot, right? So let's just keep this in mind. So I realize though, we're going back thousands of years ago. And so I realize I also, it comes to my mind, this must be about planet X. Follow along with me here. So he goes to say to me, it was not only about the giant situation, but that I would call super giants where they were state, uh, stating, excuse me, maybe that word is started. They have proof that leads them to believe that there were at one point these super giants. <laughs> Did you just hear that? 
the Pentagon scientists believed that at one point there were these super giants. They don't base that on just anything. They claim that they reached heights of 1,000 to 2,000 feet tall. And they're not just delegating this to the Native American fo uh, folklore, which Native Americans apparently had folklore that said the giants were so tall that their heads were literally in the clouds. They kind of led you to believe that the giants that were referenced in the Bible really were only about 15 to 20 feet tall. They were giants, but they weren't super giants as recorded in Enoch. The biblical giants were a more palatable size. It wasn't like a giant that was so tall his head reached the clouds, and now they have identified quite a few terrestrial objects that the scientists claim are leftovers or basically deceased body parts of these giants that are actually mountains. Yeah. Now I realize what I'm sharing with you now is going to sound almost like a fairy tale. And listen, take it or leave it. I'm not asking you to believe one way or the other when it comes to that. And I don't say necessarily what my personal view is, but I'm asked on situations like this, and in particular because of this very statement here, I was asked in all the research that I have ever done in the ancient documents, have I ever run across a document that would support that giants were like mountains or had become mountains later, like, like a tree that becomes petrified wood out in the desert. And I don't really know the process, how that works, but over time, the, the piece of wood becomes like a stone. Well, oddly enough, the answer was yes. I was very much aware that there was a passage in the Dead Sea Scrolls that spoke of giants like that of a mountain. I'll read it for you. It's in the Damascus document 4Q265. In fact, let me just share it with you on the screen here so you can see it for yourself. This is just the English version of it. Hear now, my sons, and I will uncover your eyes, that you may see and understand the works of God, that you may choose that which pleases him and reject that which he hates, that you walk perfectly in his ways, not follow after the thoughts of the guilty inclination after eyes of lust. For through them great men have gone astray, mighty heroes have stumbled from the former times till now. Because they walked in the stubbornness of their heart, the heavenly watchers fail. They were caught because they did not keep the commandments of God. Their sons also fell, who were tall as cedar trees and whose bodies were like mountains. All flesh on dry land perished. When their bodies hit the ground, they were like mountains. And oddly enough, there's other places as well that may allude to that similar thought in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and there were other writings in the Egyptian writings that I've read that I've also wondered if it could not possibly allude to that. But this, by the way, friends, is not where we're going when it comes to this Planet X. So definitely don't stop the video. It's fixing to get very interesting. They also are persuaded, as I continue in this meeting uh, notes, in their reports, that if we were able to uh, excavate into these mountains, they would find gold in large deposits because they feel that over a significant amount of time, the blood commonly would turn to gold. And so like at Devil's Mountain in Wyoming, at the base of this location, there would probably, uh, probably yield billions and billions of dollars worth of gold. Yet you can't excavate it because it's considered a national park or a national monument. Well, you know, most people, when they think of Devil's Mountain, and let me just share that with you there uh, in Wyoming there, the national monument, maybe many of you are aware of it. And I forget what they told me. I want to say they said that this was something like that of a hip or, or something like that is what they believed. Uh, 
This is not the actual one that they're doing the excavation of. If I can ever get the right, yeah, let me just go to images here. Here we go. Um, oh, still got a bad one there. How do I end up with the same junk? And I keep going into the same stuff over and over and over and over. Anyway, you can see it right there though for yourself there. I don't remember if this was part of the, uh, considered to be part of a, a leg bone, and I know that sounds completely bizarre, right? Completely bizarre. But I do know that, and and I can't divulge everything that was discussed with me in this particular meeting, but there have been other locations that they are, the scientists from our government have discovered mountains that have attributes DNA evidence of human remains that we might say are petrified. This is why I was being asked for, for ancient documents that might back up this. Was it really true? Did we, not only did we have giants that were the size of mountains, you know, but whatever, what were other evidences that I might be aware of? But as I said, there's a reason behind this. All right, there is a very serious reason. So let's continue on. So as I said there, they, they claimed that if they could excavate this mountain, they believe they'd find a lot, a lot of gold because of the blood. Now that, like I said, sounded preposterous. But for me, it did not sound preposterous. And I'll tell you why. Not that blood just turns into gold over, say, thousands of years. I, I really don't know the answer to that. But what did come to my mind, though, was from Exodus chapter 32, verse 20. And this is where we read about Moses taking, and it says, and he took the calf, which they had made. And we know the calf, by the way, was made out of gold. And he burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Now, why would Moses do that? <clears throat> I don't really know the answer for it, to, you know, I mean, to destroy the idol is one thing, but to grind it to powder and then put it in the water and make them drink, that's like monoatomic gold. Now, I'm not encouraging anybody to get monoatomic gold by no means, but I do know, I've heard enough about real monoatomic gold that has longevity of life if you take it. <clears throat> in fact, we know that after the children of Israel drank from this water, washed their clothes in it and everything else, they, they, their bodies did not age for 40 years. Their clothes and their shoes did not wear out. Was it that gold in there that did that? And of course, them ingesting the gold, that would end up becoming part of their blood. So is that possible that that scripture there might incline us to believe that <clears throat> perhaps there could be some truth to this blood issue and being that there would be a lot of gold under this mountain. I don't know the answer to that. As I said, I don't even know if I can believe it personally. It doesn't really matter to me if I believe it or not. It's just interesting. Let's continue on. <clears throat> Continuing in my notes here. The other thing that was kind of interesting, actually I found very interesting. You remember back before 2012, there's this whole hoopla made about the Mayans said that in 2012 is going to be the end of humanity or civilization or something to that effect? Well, from 2005 to 2010, the U.S. government spent billions of dollars in researching the Mayan prophecy. However, the information that was made public was much different than the information in top secret reports. That's what I was telling you about. The government researchers believed that there was some sort of Planet X. Here we go, friends. Put on your seatbelt. And that when it passed, there was some sort of war between the inhabitants of Planet X and Earthlings. And the Earth excuse me, and the war was not necessarily like the traditional war that we think of, but it was a spiritual war. Did you just hear what I just said? 
the spiritual war. Now we're talking about in the days of like the flood, right? You know, like the great flood on the on the earth there when when Noah was commanded to go build this ark. And we read about the, the flood come on the earth and, and all the, you know, the, the people and the animals and everything perished on the earth. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing something with you that's going to blow you away, I believe. I mean, really and truly, this is, as I've said before, you know, of like biblical proportions. But the thing is, is the Pentagon knows this is about to happen again. What got my attention, though, is when they started talking about Planet X, is that not only did the Pentagon believe from the Mayan documents that were not made public that there was a Planet X, but there was a war between Earthlings and the reptilians that lived on Planet X. Yes. And that it was not a traditional war, but he says here that we think, but it was a spiritual war. Understanding the document released internally was a little confusing on who won the war, or who were the bad guys, or who were the good guys. It was a bit difficult to interpret. Planet X, which is occupied by some sort of reptilian race, who is more interested in finding hosts for their spirit transference, giving them the ability to possess a human host on earth. <laughs> I mean, that's just like the devil, isn't it? How many times did Jesus have to cast out demons out of the people when he was here on earth? Apparently, the last time that Planet X came around, there was a huge war, and the people that were on Earth, I believe it was the people that were on Earth, had overcome these reptilians from Planet X who were trying to take over an enormous amount of human host, which apparently they were fairly successful. But there was some sort of war, and these reptilian hosts that were on Earth, keeping in mind they didn't deploy all the reptilians from Planet X to Earth, rather than they sent down a battalion or some type of group of uh, reptilians, similar to that of wartime battalions, of a certain number of reptilians. But there was a certain number of reptilians that were left on the earth, and those reptilians were confined deep in the ocean, deep in the second ocean of the earth, which is deeper than our Pacific Ocean or Atlantic Ocean. You know, as, as I went back and examined my notes, and it's not exactly word for word the things that are said to me, but I take very extensive notes, I could not help but think of other scriptures that made me think of these things. One of those in particular is from Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. And I don't know if I have that one on the screen or not. Uh, no, I got this one is on Revelation. Let me just let me pull it up for you though, because uh, I want you to be able to see this on your screen as well. Um, so we'll just try to go to. I have it here where I was writing all this up today to be able to share with you. Now think about it like this here. All right, this is, this is just fascinating to me. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out that what old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Think about that. one. Now, by the way, 
I was told this war took place on the last passing of the planet, or at least they believe that's when it was. So whether or not this happened in the days of the Andalusian destruction or even after that, there's some people believe that that passing of that planet happened also during the times of Egypt with, with, with Moses and the Egyptians, etc. I don't know the answer to that. But we know that on this planet X are reptilians. This is from the very Mayan documents that we don't have access to, but have been made top secret by our government. And therefore, only their scientists have access to study it. We told they're reptilians. And if you remember the battle that was fought in the heavens... which if planet X is coming through our solar system, there's a battle going on there, but there's also a battalion here on the earth. And the great dragon, that old serpent, in other words, a reptilian called the devil, Satan, which is to see the whole world, he was cast into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now, I normally look at this as being a battle that was fought during the times of our Christ, our Lord and Savior. Now, these are just thoughts that I'm sharing with you, all right? Just keep that in mind. Not absolutes. Just as I look at some of the things that I'm reading here, I want to share with you some of the thoughts that I have. Let's continue on. If you look at Enoch in chapter 60, verse 7, let me see if I even have that. I think I do. Yeah, I have it right here. This is what we read in the book of Enoch. And on that day, two monsters will be separated from one another. A female monster whose name is Leviathan. I ring a bell? To dwell in the depths of the sea. If you remember from my very notes right here, I just read to you that when this battle was done, they took these reptilians and they put them in the deepest depths of the sea. Deeper than the Pacific, deeper than the Atlantic. Then it says, above the springs of the waters. If you read down in verse 9, And I asked that the other angel to show me the power of those monsters, how they were separated on one day and thrown one into the depths of the sea. The other was thrown onto dry ground of the desert. Now, and we're going to come back to this one as well. I'll go ahead and read a little bit of everything I have on the screen for you from Enoch, chapter 60. The angel of peace who was with me said to me, These two monsters prepared in accordance with the greatness of the Lord will feed them the punish, uh, punishment of the Lord, and children will be killed with their mothers and sons with their fathers. So by the way, it wasn't just... Leviathan, but it's all them and their children. Which, as I've already read to you from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the giants were as tall as cedars. And those same waters will undergo a change in those days, for when those angels are punished in those days, the temperatures of those springs of water will change. When the angels come up, that water of the springs will change and become cold. If you go down to verse 13, For these waters of judgment serve for the healing of the bodies of the angels and for the lust of their bodies, but they do not see and do not believe that these waters will change and will become a fire which burns forever. That'll make more sense in a moment too. Okay, let me continue on here. Also, Isaiah 27, 1, I also noted this one here. In that day, the Lord with his sword and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Again, we have the scriptural evidence of reptilians. We're just getting the word serpent. In my notes here, I continue on. They were then imprisoned there in the deepest oceans, but it's not clear. This is the Mayans' history, he reminded me. It was not clear how they were imprisoned 
in this body of water, but according to this Mayan document, they were not able to, to, to terminate the life of these reptilian aliens and then were not able to banish them to another dimension. They're kind of stuck with them here on Earth. I found that fascinating as well because that's exactly what happened to Satan who is a reptilian. He is placed in the depths of the sea or some type of place that we read about scripturally. And yet, not only that though, the documents that they were researching there, they weren't able to kill them or anything. But if you remember in Genesis 4.15, we read, And the Lord said unto him, speaking about Cain, there's a lot of debate about Cain. I won't get into that issue right now, but just saying this, this is the reason I bring it up. Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. You see, there was no death penalty when it come to our Heavenly Father. He was not for a death penalty. Satan is for a death penalty, but the Heavenly Father was not. Because the first murder ever committed on earth was committed by Cain. And he was afraid that they would take vengeance on him. So God set a mark upon him that no man would touch him. Just think about that. <laughs> I won't go there. A lot of thoughts cross my mind when I read that one. Continuing on in the notes here. Since they couldn't destroy or banish them, yet they represented a continual threat of somehow possessing people. It was recorded in the documents that it was not uncommon for the reptilians to possess humans. The only way they could actually control them was with water. And water was a sort of membrane that was like a spiritual safety. You know, before I go further in that, let me just remind you guys of a couple of things here scripturally. Right? Jesus says here to the Pharisees, and it doesn't mean every Pharisee, okay? So please keep that in mind. Nicodemus came to Jesus, believed that he was the son of God. But Jesus says here, verse starting verse 31, uh, or maybe verse 30 here in chapter 23, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Jesus goes on to say, wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill you up the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? So Jesus is identifying certain, the, certain ones of the Pharisees of being descendants or the seed of reptilians. And where does he get that from? Because we know in the book of Ezra, chapter 9, we read, Now when these things were done, the princes drew near unto me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from peoples of the lands. Lands now, by the way, also not, not uh, Babylon, doing according to their abominations. Even the Canaanites, the Hittites, Perizzites, and Jebusites, the Ammonites, and the Moabites, Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the peoples of the lands. Anybody that knows anything about these people? This is where we read about the giants. Over in the book of Numbers, chapter 18. You remember that? Yes, the book of Numbers, chapter 18. And if I got just a moment, I'll try to take you there just as a reminder Right? This is the Nephilim that we read about. Uh, I believe that is where it is. Let's see. Maybe I'm wrong on this. No, it's not. Not numbers. Let's see here. No. All right. Let me get this mixed up here. Um. Oh, my goodness. Maybe it's Deuteronomy. I don't think it's going to be Deuteronomy either. Let me just see, though. Nope, I forget exactly where it's at there. This is where we read about the Nephilim. 
And um, actually, I know I could find it for you. Let's just do it this way here. In the King James Version, that calls them giants. Uh, Numbers 1333. That's where we want to go. All right. And this is why I say this, because in the... We know that when the spies went down to spy out the land, they were the giants that were there, the Nephilim. They spread an evil report of the land, which they had spied out in the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have passed to spy it out is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And the people that we saw in it are men of great statue, or stature. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from, that literally should be Nephilim, not Nephilim. His sons are the Nephilim. Notice the difference in spelling. Henun fe yod lamed yod mem. But Nephilim has no additional load be, uh, yod between the fe and the lamed. That's how you know what it really should say. All right. They look like grasshoppers. So how tall really were they? Were they only 15 to 20 foot or were they really much larger? If you look like a grasshopper next to that guy, they may have been like the cloud eaters that the Native American Indians spoke about, right? I don't know the answer to that. But anyway, there's your biblical scriptures that back up what I'm telling you right there. Now, since they couldn't destroy or banish them, yet they represented a continual threat of somehow possessing the people. It was recorded in the documents that it was not uncommon for the reptilians to possess humans. The only way they could actually control them was with water. And water was some sort of membrane that was like a spiritual safety. Pardon me just a second. Here we go. So they put them under the second ocean and that membrane was supposed to keep us clear. Scientifically, we still refer to these different dimensions. This is from my notes I took, by the way, as being separated by membranes. Perhaps the ocean represents another dimension. We don't really know. So where the 2012 destruction comes in, according to the Mayans, was the Mayans felt that in 2012, the membrane would start to decay. And these so-called reptilians Creatures would start to gain access back on earth where they would once again possess the people. Now, <laughs> this is where it gets really interesting. Where they would have access to get back on the earth to possess the people. Let me see if I can find the right scripture for this. Yeah. This is where I kind of looked at this from a scriptural standpoint. Most people look at the Gog of Magog War, written here in Revelation 20, verse 8, as not just a future event, but to be after a millennial reign. The true Greek translation for the word thousand here is not singular. Now, you got to do some serious research to find that out. If you just go to you know, a, a strong concordance. You might get it in some of the older ones, but you're got, you're not. You got to do the research. It is the word thousands, plural, and there's no definitive time. So it says, when the thousands years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Remember, we know that Satan was cast out. We also know from scriptural evidence, the dragon, which is Satan, is in the depths of the sea. Could that, could he have been in prison there earlier than what we realize? He and his minions. And could this scripture here in Revelation be alluding to the same thing that the Mayan document speaks about? the membrane will begin to break down. That's an interesting concept, if you ask me. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. If you guys remember 
about a year ago, I taught something came upon my heart and I didn't fully understand it. And I said, the Gog of Magog war is not the war you think it is. We get this analogy here, and I believe it's more of an analogy of a battle between the area around Turkey. But I felt in my own heart it is going to be fought between Satan and his own angels, the fallen demons, the devils that have come to this earth. And that we're about to face that. That's why I believe when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he overcomes Satan. Satan is bound, supposed to be bound. But unfortunately, we find out in the scripture, the book of Revelation, the power is given unto the beast. Who's it given to? Who gives him the power? Man does. Churches do. They become weak. Have we through CERN, have we broken down through our own technology? Are we breaking down the dimension that holds him in prison? Is that what the Mayan actually spoke about? I don't really know the answers to this, but you know, this is not just a battle for the Pentagon or the scientists at the Pentagon. We are all going to be facing this. So being with the full armor of God, is what Paul says in Ephesians, right? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I said also, I don't think that Paul was just talking about an allegoric sense, but rather he knew that we were about to be facing as he calls it, principalities, which are the archons, the devils, the demons, the reptilians. This is not just any passive battle, friends, that we are facing. I asked the question, is there a belief that they think something similar to Planet X is going to pass by now? This is what he answered me. And this is a good friend of mine that is a scientist at the Pentagon. Very high clearance. And was reviewing all this documentation. He said, yes. So they do believe that there is going to be another passing of Planet X. He said, however, I have heard our people say it is on a very long elliptical orbit. So there is no date given in the Mayan documents as to when this so-called Planet X will return. When it's coming around next, it's going to be another similar occurrence where these reptilians on Planet X are going to make a full-scale attempt again to try to possess as many humans as they can. You know, I don't know how much of the brass or the, the generals and the admirals are aware of this in the Pentagon, of this documentation or this type of battle. But the researchers and the intelligence agencies and the Pentagon, etc., they know we're about to face a battle that was of biblical proportions, not just some little folklore, but a real spiritual battle. And even they themselves are noting it to be a spiritual battle. And as I said, they talk about the elliptical orbit. And again, the Chilean astronomer, as I mentioned to you guys before, Ferrata, and he spoke about Planet X being on an elliptical orbit. I also looked at Revelation chapter 16 when I was considering what evidence would we have? What have we got scripturally that maybe we've overlooked or applied it some other way? And again, this is not a, just a, um, I'm not saying this is a doctrine. I'm saying examine these things for your consideration. I mean, think about it. We already know in the book of Luke, right? Jesus says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea waves roaring, tidal waves in other words, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on earth. 
for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. <laughs> that describes to a T right there in verse 26 exactly what I'm being told from people in the Pentagon. They're expecting planet X to come through. That's in the heaven. And they're, and they're saying that man's hearts are going to fail for fear. And they're also saying things are come up, coming up on the earth. And they're saying the reptilians are going to come back upon the earth because the membrane or the ocean, whatever it is, according to the Mayan documents, will break down. Revelation 16. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirit like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets, false prophets, excuse me. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And that's talking about Armageddon. I can't help but wonder, could this, when the angel pours out his vial, this Great River Euphrates drying up. Could that just be an allegoric verbiage? Because no river is going to slow down any nation on this planet. They got planes, they can go over that. They got boats, they can, they can take the boat over. They got, they got tanks that can go across. They ain't going to stop, stop them. But could it be that there's something scripturally sitting there that speaks about the event that we're reading about now, that we're talking about now. Something for you to consider. If you look at verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that washeth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Um, that's not the one I was thinking about. Oh, it's actually verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils working. I already read that. Okay. Uh, we read that already. Okay. Let me continue with the notes here. So right now, the big concern is not planet X, but there is a comet that is going to create havoc in December. At least this is their opinion right now. And this year, and that's what a lot of mathematical resources are geared towards now because it does the same thing. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because what they're talking about here is that maybe that Planet X is really coming now and I'm only being told that there's some kind of comet coming. I don't know. And by the way, it really makes me wonder too about uh, these asteroids they talked about in late November which I did get a better understanding. It seems that even this so-called comet could be what is affecting those asteroids. That's why they have a possibility of these asteroids hitting the subsubduction zone and also near Puerto Rico. But if I understood right in the meetings I've been in here, is that this comet may be what affects it because I was told that this comet that's coming in is also in an elliptical orbit and it changes its speed. So it also makes it fluid as to when it will actually show up. And I think that's why I keep getting these date changes. I don't know the answer to it, but of course, well, you'll know in a second here, There we do have several nations working together to, to break up a lot of these uh, threatening asteroids and meteorites that are threatening the Earth. But he wrote here, or he, not wrote here, but said to me here, it's going to create havoc in December this year, and that's what a lot of mathematical resources are geared towards. Now, because it does, this, does the same thing and, it's, uh, and, it, and exhibits the same sort of attributes as planet X, where the comet speeds up and slows down, in addition to all that, the orbit, as we understand it now, where the trajectory of this comet is going uh, to be, it's going to be hitting hundreds of these meteors and asteroids like a cue ball on a pool table bouncing off the other balls. There are three countries now working in space trying to minimize the risk of the incoming debris or comets. And this, and, and excuse me, and with this uh, comet coming, 
it is creating a lot of issues. So all the estimates and everything like what's going to what it's going to hit, where and if there's going to be any impacts is sort of being thrown out the window because they don't know what effects this comet is really going to have on everything. So they are trying to come up with probabilities, but unfortunately there is just too many variables going on right now. There's even consideration right now that there is going to be very a bad solar storm probably in March of next year, and that solar storm is going to kick off a large number of volcanic activity and earthquakes. They're planning to halt mining exploration because of this December comet and creating so many problems. There's just so many variables. It's just like shooting, again, a cue ball on a pool table. And the chances are extremely high that there is something going to ricochet and hit the Earth. But at this point, they don't really know what, when, or why, or how. So at any rate, a lot of things are going on. And a lot of changes are taking place. I also, uh, and some of this I'll be sharing over on our Patreon channel with people as well, the temperature changes, why we're having a, a very cold winter. There's a specific reason for that. I'll get into that on our Patreon channel. Hopefully tomorrow I can post that video. But I really felt that this was critical. Because our own government, is aware of a battle that is coming that we normally just look at as a spiritual battle. In one way, it is a spiritual battle. But it's also a real battle. And without Jesus Christ and his intervention, I can see where this could very, go very, very wrongly. But thanks be to God, we do have an advocate with our Lord Jesus Christ. There are many, many things going on, friends, and I, I don't speak about these things enough, but I think it's important that you do remember the EMP shield, especially with what's coming this winter. I don't know. I know what's supposed to cause it. So I think even an EMP shield would be worth getting as a result. And if you get one, don't forget, I'll just walk you through it easily. You add to the card, it's empshield.com. But in order to get an additional discount, you want to include INL50 as your coupon code. All right, notice that on your screen there, because that saves you an additional $50 off. They have some type of sale. I don't know what it is, but they got some type of sale. INL50 right there, okay? You apply that coupon, and when you do, no matter how many times you apply it, oh, if they got a Thanksgiving Day sale. Okay, great. It'll knock it down another $50, and now you can get uh, an EMP shield for your home. Instead of $389, you can get it for $305. I really think it's a great investment, and you might want to consider that for you and your family. Um, also, as a reminder, if you feel led on your heart to support the work we do, please consider giving. Consider joining our Patreon community. It's another way you can support this ministry. I also had a couple of scriptures marked out here. Oh, yes, I just want to remind you, Matthew 24, 7, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. I've wondered now, after what I've read to you, if that passage there in Matthew 24, 7, the kingdom against kingdom is not going to be the kingdom of Christ fighting against Satan's kingdom. If you remember, Satan has a kingdom. Scripture says he does. If Satan's kingdom is divided, then his kingdom cannot stand. Just want to share these things with you, friends. We love you. We appreciate you tremendously. Our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Uh, in fact, I think Yana wrote an interesting article here just recently. Israelis complain. Uh, well, you can see the title. We're going to be getting into a lot more things coming up. We have also more uh, professionals that we're going to be interviewing that I think you'll find interesting too. 
I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. God bless you and good evening.